It's the third week of July, 1978. Deep in the heart of the British Columbia wilderness, Mount Robson, the highest peak in the Canadian Rockies, stands tall like a sentinel in the early morning light. To the south and west, the mountain is surrounded by a lush rainforest of fir, pine, and spruce. It towers almost 10,000 feet above the Yellowhead Highway. And up the valley, past the shores of Kinney Lake, following the Robson River around to the north, the majestic Emperor Face rises nearly 8,000 feet above the tranquil waters of Berg Lake. The Face has never been climbed. But on this morning, a mile above on this foreboding wall of rock and ice, two of North America's boldest young climbers, Jamie Logan and Mug Stump, are waking up from their second night on the wall. They know they're getting close to the top because just up and to the left, they can see the far edge of the north face. But directly above their bivy ledge, the climbing looks hard, really hard. So we brewed up and then it was Muggs' lead and Muggs went up and left a whole rope link and found himself at the base of an overhanging rock cirque. This is Jamie Logan. And it was steep, it overhung, and it was my lead. Not only were the stakes much higher, but the bar that you needed to overcome to accomplish a climb like that was just much higher. This is world-renowned alpinist Steve House. Ice climbing was really in its complete infancy. There was no such thing as what we would call mixed climbing. I mean, that's what they were doing, but they didn't have a name for it. Everything everything was an order of magnitude stacked against them. So I started up it, and I was aiding, pounding in pins and aiding, and they were going in. The climbing is complex and difficult. Jamie uses a combination of aid and free climbing, sometimes standing in aiders, other times climbing in bare hands or wool gloves. After more delicate climbing, she comes across a small overhang with a solitary icicle hanging from its edge. With no cracks for pitons or nuts, she grabs a piece of webbing and slips it around the icicle. And I was pushing my girth hitch up the icicle and then pulling on it to get it to stick. I got it up, I think I got it up to where the icicle was maybe an inch in diameter. So then I climbed up the icicle, standing in aiders, until my hands are at the top of it. In 1978, people were not using bolts for protection. There was no sport climbing. There was no falling on lead. Harnesses had just been invented. Ropes didn't really stretch very much. They, they did stretch some, but it was more by accident than by design the way it is now. In the modern world, climbers have access to a near unlimited supply of lightweight yet durable gear. But back in 1978, it was a completely different game. Helmets were made of fiberglass. Ice axe picks weren't reverse curved. Ice axe shafts were straight. You just grabbed some webbing and tied it to it and made a loop and put your hand through it. You get uh, Muggs and Jamie Logan going in there. This is legendary Canadian Rockies alpinist, Barry Blanchard. You know, it's a really important stepping stone, just being able to figure it out and persevere. And Jamie is persevering. Still dangling from the tenuous icicle, standing in aiders, she's far above her last piece of gear. A fall here would not be good, so she tries to put in an ice screw. So I tap a little hole, and I get it in, and I get the screw, and I'm screwing it in. And I know that every screw I screw it in, the better it's going to be, because the more of it's going to be in there. But every turn of the screw causes the ice to creak. If she puts it in too far, the whole piece of ice could shatter away causing a dangerous fall, which, in Jamie's words, that would be a crisis. For all intents and purposes, they were on the moon, right? Like, there was no, like, if if something happened to them, even just a simple fall and a broken leg, I mean, they were were done. Like, that was, was like, game over. 
So at this point in time, Jamie's been leading this pitch for hours. She's exhausted, but she's also totally committed. Like, they don't have enough gear to retreat from the face. The only way off is up. It's really hard climbing. So now I'm on the hardest mixed climbing I've ever done in my life by an order of magnitude. The knife blade is 30 feet below me. Tenuously, move by move, she keeps climbing. And so I'm now in the corner and I'm stemming out and I've gotten work in this handhold. I get up a little higher and there's a little shelf up there and I can reach it with my axe. She reaches up high as far as she can with her axe and tries to clear the snow off the ledge, hoping to find a handhold. But the pick of the axe starts hooking in the same place, so it hooks. And I pull on it and it feels pretty good. She's now been leading this pitch for six hours, maybe seven. She's 30 feet above her last pin and dangling from her arms with her strength running out. It's now or never. Finally, I decide that that's it. Come in. Come in. Come in. This season, we're going back in time to unlock the history of some of North America's most iconic mountains and routes. Over the years, the mountains of North America have captivated some of the world's leading climbers, leading them to the wild arenas of the Canadian Rockies, the North Cascades, the Tetons, the Alaska Range. Their stories are etched on these high alpine walls. Their visions follow lines of cold gray ice. What inspires them? What makes them come back? Who survives? Who suffers? These are the stories we'll tell on season six of The Fern Line. This is episode one, The Emperor Face. All right, well, welcome back to a brand new season of The Fern Line. So last year, as some of you might have noticed, I took some time away from the show, but ultimately I think that was a good thing. I needed to take a step back and take a deep breath. But like the mountains have a way of calling you back, this podcast also has a way of calling me back. So here we are. One of the things I wanted to do this season is get back to the roots of why I started the Fern Line in the first place. And that was to reconnect with, to tell stories about the climbers, mountains, and routes that inspired me as a young alpinist. And one of those mountains is Mount Robson. And like a lot of stories you're going to hear in this episode, my own relationship with Robson lasted years. I came back time and time again, spending time with the mountain, exploring its many moods and seasons, trying to climb it and failing. This is something that Steve House can relate to. Seeing this happen with other people with Robson, where it kind of casts its spell on you, and you just kind of have to go in and like explore and be close to it and spend time with it. Which is exactly what I did. After three attempts over as many years, I did succeed in climbing Robson back in 1999. And it's a memory that I carry with me to this day. And even after all these years, I'm still captivated by Robson's stunning beauty its intriguing complexity, and its sheer size. Mount well, Robson is the highest peak in the Canadian Rockies, and I think it's also one of the most beautiful mountains. And you see it, and you can tell it's big, but you can also tell that it's far away, and it's complicated, and there's a lot of really, really wild country between you and it. The other part of Mount Robson that makes it really intriguing is just the sheer size of it. It's From any side, it just has a tremendous amount of relief compared to the, you know, the the terrain right around it. Here's Barry Blanchard. You're at the Fraser, you're looking up, you're looking at over 3,000 meters of relief. So, you know, were you to have uh, the creator's train saw and you cut off Robson at that level and lifted it up and put it down on the Tibetan plateau beside Everest, they'd be about the same size. It feels aloof. It feels like distant always, you know, it feels remote. It's, it's hard to get there. It also is really intriguingly complex. Steve's right. Mount Robson is incredibly complex with no easy route to the summit. 
Its perimeter is surrounded by thick forest, guarded by sheer walls of loose rock, bands of ice, and perhaps its most unique feature, the summit ridge gargoyles. Some of them 50, 60 feet high. Um, you know, the big ones are 80 feet high. And they're just snow crystals held into place. And they will collapse when it's warm enough. And they're sometimes hollow. They're like these ephemeral structures. And they look like match strikes. If you zoom in on a match, when you hit it and it blooms out, they kind of look like that, but they're frozen. They're match strikes of ice. For Steve House, Robson cast its spell early. He was captivated by the Emperor Face, its history, and the adventure seekers who first climbed it. You know, you always look at those maps, and for me it was the, the picture in the old Sean Dougherty book, and you could see this red line going straight up through the middle of this picture of this big black and white face, and then you'd see like the little bivvies marked, and you'd notice that they were really close together. <laughs> You knew that that meant that it was really hard in between those little little tent symbols. And that in and of itself, like, piqued my curiosity. Like, it's just like, what is up there? What did, what did they find up there? They, they did it. They climbed it in 1978, I believe. And this takes us back to Jamie Logan, leading that overhanging pitch high on the Emperor face in July of 1978. But to understand how Jamie got there, we need to first go back to the late 1960s, when she was one of a small group of climbers pushing the limits of free climbing in Yosemite. It was kind of like the two best climbers from every area. And we were all 18 and 19 years old, and we actually had no idea how good we were. We were just a bunch of kids. Jamie honed her free climbing skills with a small band of hotshots including the late Jim Bridwell. This was a free and easy time, but that wouldn't last. Went to Vietnam, came back, and was kind of a wreck for quite a while. But I started getting back into climbing. In the early 1970s, there was a growing push to take the emerging rock climbing tactics of Yosemite Valley to the greater mountain ranges. Big climbs were being done from the Alps to the Canadian Rockies, and Jamie wanted to get in on the action. This culminated in 1975, when she and her partner, Wayne Goss, made the first free ascent of the diamond on Long's Peak. Which was a real coup because there were a lot of people who said it could, would never go free, but I'd been up on it the year before and free climbed all but 10 feet of it. So we were sure it would go free. And the thing that was cool too is that it was the first time it was ever climbed without a haul bag or baby gear or a hammer. So it was, you know, stoppers and hexes. It was cool. And then uh, we started going into the snow and ice stuff. And what really happened is that waterfall climbing started to happen. And things were just getting started. Jamie made the third ascent of Bridal Veil Falls and then up the ante by making the second American ascent of the Eiger North Face. Then, in September 1976, along with Mike Weiss, she made her first trip into the Emperor Face of Mount Robson. Mike had been in the year before with Jeff Lowe and spent some weeks under the face waiting for some weather. And it was September and it, it was perfect weather and he really, really wanted to go on the face. But Jamie, she just wasn't ready. I was entranced with it, but freaked out. So Jamie and Mike split up, opting to climb already established routes on Robson. He climbed the North Face, I climbed the Cane Face with some people. We came down, but I sort of got in the bug because the Iger was first done in 1938, right? And here we were, 40 years later, looking at a face that was bigger and cooler and harder than the Iger. And I thought, the Emperor face is significant. Whoever does the first descent of the Emperor face is going to have a significant place in the history of mountaineering. So, in the winter of 1977, Jamie headed back into the Emperor face, this time with another strong group of climbers, including Jim Danini, Mike Munger, and Dakers Gallons. We skied in sometime in like January, February, and it was cold, and it was huge, deep, soft snow. The team attempted a line straight up the middle of the face, spending two nights on a ledge with massive avalanches coming down all around them. 
After retreating, Jamie knew the Emperor wasn't a winter climb, at least for her, but she wasn't done with Robson. The following summer, Jamie got invited to attempt the second ascent of Mount Logan's Hummingbird Ridge, a monolithic and extremely dangerous route in Canada's Yukon Territory. The team comprised of Logan, Barry Sparks, and Randy Trover, but they were looking for a fourth member, and that's where fate intervened. And um, Randy said, there's this guy, there's this kid here who's a pretty good climber, and he wants to go with us. His name is Mug Stump. The four climbers made a bold attempt on the hummingbird, spending 10 thrilling days on the route before retreating. But during the climb, Jamie and Muggs had forged a friendship and a strong partnership in the mountains. It didn't take long before they made plans to attempt the emperor face. We climbed together that winter. He kind of come and gone. We'd been in Telluride. We'd been in Utah. He came back in this early summer, which was our plan. And, um, We rock climbed a little bit and did this packing of the gear, sorting of the gear, and getting it all ready. The two climbers planned as much as they could, but without any guidebooks and no one having ever been up high on the face, they were basically launching into unknown territory. Here's Steve House. You know, to put this in context, just I think it's worth stepping back and thinking about just where climbing was. There was no information. And I think that... That's the that's the piece that we can sort of never really conceptualize in this day and age. But then Jamie received a photograph in the mail from her friend John Barstow. So this photograph arrives, and it's a single picture shot from the helicopter of the upper half of the face, perfect focus. It's like it was magical. Jamie studied the photograph. So the lower part of the face is characterized by ice slopes that are 60 degrees, and then a vertical piece of rock, which is 20 or 40 or 50 feet tall, another ice slope. And they're all patchy. So if you know where you're going, if you have a photograph, you can figure out when you get on one of the ice slopes where you want to go and go through the rock to get onto the the correct ice slope to get you where you want them to go. I could see that at the beginning of this steep rock thing, there was a white line. On an 8 by 10 photograph, it was a very thin white line, but it was consistent, and it ran through the whole lower part of the rock band. And I thought, well, that's where we're going. So, in early July, Jamie and Muggs headed for the Emperor phase. They were determined to stay all summer if need be. But first, they checked in at the ranger station. We went to the ranger station for Robson, and we walked in and said, we're going to go try to climb the emperor face on the backside and do you we need to sign in or get permission or do you care about when we're leaving or when we're supposed to come back and he said no good luck (laughs) (laughs) jamie and mugs hiked into the emperor face setting up a base camp near berg lake they looked up and studied the wall then they waited We wanted to do from the bottom to the top, the line to drop the waterfalls, which wasn't exactly, but still, it it seemed like that face deserved to start out uh, straight up the middle. For two weeks, it rained, and it rained, and it rained. It rained so much that the team decided to walk out and head back to Jasper for a few days to get a meal, grab a few beers, and recharge. But within days, they headed back in, and after one final storm, they finally woke up to clear skies. We woke up and the storm had stopped, and the face was white, and it looked hard, and it was a beautiful day, and we decided we were gonna go. I just think that for those two to kind of show up and just blanch up this 6,000 foot alpine face and to think like, oh yeah, we're just gonna head up this middle of that. Like, I mean, who, who thinks that? We got pretty high up onto the face because it's not that steep at the bottom. And in the middle of the face was this 
proud of wet of snow, not wet snow, just snow, big snow prow. Right smack in the middle of the face. And so we traversed over to it. It was about a half a rope length or something, maybe going over there. And we had a shovel and we dug out these thrones like like a recliner you watch TV in. We made two of them <laughs> side by side with a, with a shelf in between, right, for the stove. It was like the most deluxe bivy ever. And as you're sitting there and you're looking out at the cold Canadian Rockies out going north, and just to your left is Whitehorn with a still unclimbed 4,000 foot face. The next day, the duo continued upwards, climbing through rock bands covered with thin ice. It was tedious and insecure climbing. But then Jamie found herself at the base of the ice ribbon she'd seen so clearly in the photograph. And it was dead vertical, three or four feet wide, and ran up for a couple hundred feet through the rock bands. And it was the funnest ice I have ever climbed. It was like perfect styrofoam ice. If you had just swung hard with your with the axe, it would have been gone in four inches and you could have belayed off of it. Jamie launched up the ice tube. And I hear Muggs yelling at me. And I stop and I'm like, what? And he's like, put something in. Like, oh, yeah, I'm 40 or 50 feet out here. Past the ice section, Jamie and Muggs continued up. And by this time, they could tell they were getting really high on the face. We got up into a, a kind of lower angle, little gully thing. And it was getting dark. And we chopped out a couple seats. And then in the middle of the night, it started to snow. And the more it snows, the more the snow starts sloughing and coming down. Now we've got these little avalanches running down against us. It was a miserable night. By now, the two climbers were cold, wet, and tired. But they were committed. Over 5,000 feet up the face, retreat would have been unthinkable. So Muggs led off from the ledge, trending up and left until he found himself under the final overhanging headwall. The climbing looked hard, and it was Jamie's lead. So I started up it, and I was aiding, pounding in pins and aiding, and they were going in. Using a combination of free, mixed, and aid tactics, Jamie worked her way up the pitch. After a few hours, she finally got a solid piece of protection. And I get in a really good one-inch angle, and I tell Mux I'm going to come down and clean the pitch because I need the gear. Armed with a bigger rack, Jamie launched onto the upper half of the pitch. The climbing was desperate. All I'm thinking about is, how do I not fall and keep moving upward? After about six or seven hours, Jamie found herself near the top of the pitch. She used her ice axe to scrape the snow off a ledge. I started mostly just trying to clean the snow off of it because I was looking for a handhold or something, and I can't get the snow off of it. But the pick of the axe starts hooking in the same place, so it hooks. And I pull on it, and it feels pretty good. She had what felt like a secure hook for her tool, but she was also 30 feet above a knife blade. Her arms were pumped. It was a climb better than you've ever climbed or die. And it was clear to me that if I fell, we were both dead. All the years of climbing, all the years of attempts and failures, everything she had done in the mountains up to that point, all came down to this one final move. It was now or never. Finally, I decide that that's it. I'm going to commit. So I hook it. I pull down and bring my hand up, work it up, get it on top of the axe. That's what we you know. So you're pushing the pick in. And then I mantled onto the ledge and stood up. So I put in two pins. I put in a sling. I tied off the rope and said, Bugs, I'm done. Jamie had done it. She'd solved the crux of one of North America's most coveted alpine walls. Although she wasn't thinking about it at the time, her lead high on the emperor face of Robson might have been the hardest mix lead ever done in the mountains up to that point. But all Jamie knew is that it was really steep. I know that when I pulled the rope later, that when Muggs jumared, he swung out 15 feet. When Muggs joined her at the belay, Jamie finally was able to let her guard down she was wasted from the effort. The climb had taken everything she had. I'd been on the pitch for, what I said then was eight hours. And in fact, we didn't have a watch, so we don't know. But I'd been on the pitch basically all day. 
It was late afternoon. And Muggs um, started, I said, I'm done. <laughs> <Get nothing. laughs> Take me to the top. <laughs> that afternoon and into the night, Muggs led another four pitches, Jamie following on Jumar's. When they got to the top of the face, they tunneled through the gargoyles on the summit ridge. Too tired to go to the summit, they crawled into their wet down sleeping bags and hunkered down for one last bivy. And then um, we were on the ridge, it was dark. My sleeping bag was soaking wet. I just remember lying there on the ridge in this wet, wet sleeping bag, really tired and thinking um, how close I came to dying. The Emperor Face was a historic climb in the annals of North American alpinism. Jamie would go on to do more hard alpine climbs in the following years, including a legendary rescue with Muggs and Jack Tackle on Denali's Isis Face in 1979. But the dangers of hard alpine climbing, they're serious, and Jamie would eventually walk away from that pursuit. Muggs would use the Emperor Face climb to launch a storied career in the mountains, his visionary climbs up the Cassine Ridge on Denali, the Moonflower Buttress on Mount Hunter, and the east face of the Moose's Tooth with Jim Bridwell would help pave the way for a future generation of alpinists. But Muggs' life, well, that's another story. The history of Mount Robson's emperor face wasn't over. In fact, a new generation of climbers would look to test themselves on this mythical alpine wall. We'll get to that and more after the break. Okay, so in 1978, Jamie and Muggs successfully climbed the Emperor Face. This is obviously a big deal. And I think it certainly cemented the Canadian Rockies as a destination for world-class alpinists to test themselves. But it was Canadian climbers that would be a real driving force for new routes on Robson's Emperor Face. And one of those climbers was Barry Blanchard. So my own uh, history probably starts in, I think it was 81, that uh, four of us went in in the summertime uh, looking to climb the Emperor face. Barry's first trip, it stormed, but he did get a good look at the face. He packed it into the back of his mind, knowing he'd eventually be back. You know, through the next uh, eight years, a lot of my ability as an alpinist came together, which was a combination of technical ability, physical strength, endurance, you know, all of that stuff, and then partners. And you need three of those magic lines to cross at a very specific, you need them to cross. And when that cross happens, that's when, you know, the really great climbs of your life will happen. Barry did indeed embark on some great climbs all around the world. But the Canadian Rockies remained his training ground, where he would establish a number of classic first ascents, including the Andromeda Strain, the east face of Mount Fay, and the North Pillar on North Twin. Eventually, in 1989, he returned to the Emperor Face for a winter attempt with Jim Elzinga and Ward Robinson. But the temperatures were minus 40 degrees, far too cold to give the route a serious try. So instead they climbed the North Face, which in those temperatures was still a very serious undertaking. On the summit, Barry enjoyed the warmth of the sun, but he still wasn't done with Robson. Another eight years down the road, 1997, it's finally time to get back and try to climb the Emperor in the wintertime. This time, Barry would go into the face with his friends, Joe Josephson and Grant Statham. And at the 11th hour, Grant Statham can't make it. But we decided, you know, I, let's go in April. If there's an Arctic air mass, it can't be as cold as in March when we had that minus 40. And that's true. April is way warmer. Grant in the 11th hour pulls the pin, so JoJo calls Steve House. At the time, Steve's 26 years old. He's working as a guide. He's really just emerging on the scene at this point in time. 
the previous December I had met Barry and I don't even remember if we climbed together. We had met in Cody, Wyoming and you know, he and Joe Josephson were heading up to the emperor face. Jojo says, can you, do you want to come? And Steve says, yeah. I think of that call off and I think of, you know, you've seen like those things on TV of like the, the athlete who gets the, and makes the NFL draft and gets the call from the pro team or whatever. That's the way I felt. I felt like I got the call from the pro team and I got drafted and I was going to play in the big leagues. You know, it was, it was really, really exciting. It was like a total dream come true. So he drives all night in his Ford Fiesta. Weather forecast was good and I needed to get up there ASAP, driving like within three hours of that phone call and heading up north. You know, sleep somewhere beside the highway. He's a total dirtbag. We actually met at, at the trailhead um, for, for Mount Robeson. Comes up to Robson to the information center and, you know, it's closed in the winter time, and, you know, there is a payphone there. So we get a weather forecast. Weather forecast is good from Environment Canada reporting forecast. And uh, we head off into Robson. I think we spent 11 or 12 days on that first trip. It was mostly just, I think, scary. And it was pretty windy up there. And we were just sitting there trying to wrap our heads around actually climbing up there. After a few days, the team made their first attempt. We try kind of where um, Stumps Logan did. We cried in one of the gullies beside the ridge that they climbed because they're in the wintertime. That was sort of an era where we were climbing with teams of three a lot, especially on harder alpine routes because the thinking was that one guy could climb with a, with no pack or, a, or just a tiny day pack and the other two would have like bigger rucksacks with like the bivy gear and the sleeping bags and stoves and stuff. And we got up and it just became snice, like vertical snow that you probably can climb but you can't protect. So it's just two, and you know, we got high enough, both Steve and I trying to do this thing, that okay, if we fall here, that's gonna be a huge consequence. So let's get out of here, let's go down. The trio made it back down safely, taking a few days to decompress. They did a little mix climbing near the lake, putting off the inevitable. But when the weather finally turned stable, they turned their attention back to the emperor face. Barry had an idea of where he thought we should the route should go, so that part was sorted. But we weren't too convinced. But the wind had died down, so they headed back up. And then we went for it. I can really remember the just the, the clear night, the dark sky, as we worked our way up through those initial slopes. We got... we climbed as high as we could without belaying. You know, just below where you get into the strip of uh, what we call Jack's Beanstalk. And we started climbing up through there. Really fantastic climbing. It goes up and it kind of dog legs left and the ice ends and it becomes sort of this classic Canadian mixed terrain. You have to tap on the rocks to make sure they're solid. You have to tap on the ice to make sure it's solid. You have to test things. You have to shift your weight from one thing to another delicately and being ready to kind of pull back if that piece of ice collapses. By this time, it was getting dark. They hadn't made it as high as they'd wanted to, and they needed to find a place for a bivy. And Barry said, hey, I think you can just head straight off left there and we can get to the ledges. So I did that. I just did this huge 200 foot pitch straight straight to the left and got to these ledges. Couldn't really find a, a place to anchor uh, very well. It was all, everything was rounded. There were no cracks. And so I just sort of sat down behind some rocks and gave them a hip belay over there. The cold was the thing that you really noticed. It was really present. And, you know, then of course we started um, trying to get ready. Uh, we found three separate little ledges that we could sleep on, or lay down on. The team went about the business of settling in for a bivy in frigid temperatures. It's dark, 
it's freezing, they're tired, they're dehydrated. Everyone's doing different chores. One person's racking and sorting gear. Steve was in charge of cooking that night, and at first, everything was going smoothly. But then... Steve dropped the pump to the stove. That's right. Steve dropped the pump to the stove. And so I couldn't find it. And it was dark. My headlamp wasn't working very well. Yeah, it's cold. And we're there. And the pump's dropped. I had a spare leather washer for an MSR compression pump. And a, a piece of coat hanger as a spare Albelikoff puller. You know, in case we lose the Albelikoff or whatever, we've got this coat hanger that we can use. I'm standing on this little ledge, rock ledge halfway up the thing, wondering where the hell this black piece of plastic is. And without it, we can't cook, we can't make water, we can't drink, we can't do anything. So Steve puts the leather washer on the coat hanger, tapes it up, and spends a couple of hours trying to compress the fuel into the stove to get enough pressure to cook. And all that work, we got a quarter cup of slush water. At that moment, sitting on the frigid ledge with two of his heroes, Steve was devastated. It was like you were called up to the big leagues, and then... You were given the big play and you fumbled it or you kicked the field goal wide right and missed it by a mile. Like, it was just like complete disaster. Like, it went from being my biggest dream to be climbing with Barry and Jojo to being like my worst nightmare. And I was completely devastated. <laughs> so we're really dehydrated. We've lost a bunch of calories. We can't drink, we can't eat really. So the next morning we don't have much choice. We gotta go down. And Steve, you know, looks like he wants to slit his wrists with his ice axes. He looks suicidal because alpinism is what he's going to do with his life, right? And, you know, he just kind of screwed up. I remember that he told me when we were on that ledge and I was about to throw myself off that, you know, he gave me sort of the, the you know, one of the, the best gift he could have given me at that moment, which was forgiveness. And he said, well, Steve, you know, at the end of your life, when you sum up all the screw-ups you're going to make, this is going to seem like small change. Which, you know, at the time, I didn't know quite how to take that, right? But but now being, you know, whatever, 30 years older, by solid middle age, I'm like, oh, yeah, 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 that's true. Like, that doesn't even register on the Richter scale of mistakes that I've made in my life. <laughs> so that was our first annual uh, attempt at failure to climb Mount Robson. So one of the themes of this story is the lure of Robson. It's one of those mountains that, for whatever reason, it calls climbers back again and again. Barry continued attempting the Emperor face. He tried in 1998, 1999, 2000, and on. Of course, other amazing climbs and experiences came out of these attempts, yet this new line on Robson's emperor face remained unclimbed until the fall of 2002. Um, in October, I got a call from a fellow guide, Eric Dumarak, and another buddy uh, who had climbed with another fellow guide from Briançon in France, uh, a French guy, Philippe Pellet, and Eric and Philippe were gonna go in uh, to try the emperor and they said you should come with us and i said yeah should i'm really busy and then i thought i'll clear my schedule <laughs> sometimes alpine climbing is like magic you can try and fail and try and fail but if you just keep trying sometimes the stars eventually align perfectly and this was the case for barry in 2002 when after years of attempts with various partners, he finally managed to climb this new line on Robson's emperor face. They would call it infinite patience. For Barry, the climb was the culmination of years of failures, interspersed with the joy of partnership, friendship, and the deep bonds that can only be created in the mountains. It was also a celebration of the mountain's unique beauty. The really amazing features on Infinite Patience are the ice features. When we climbed it in 2002, you know, we climbed a couple pitches of water ice uh, as hard as, uh, I don't know, M5, and then 
a grade four water ice that had only formed like two days before. This was newborn water ice, and it was pretty cool to be able to climb it. And at that young in its, you know, once it's only going to be around for a season, and uh, then it's going to turn to water and disappear. And then you get into this ancient gully that had a form of glaciation down it at one point. And you can see the, the trademark kind of halo that whatever small glacier left that, that ice face and that gully at whatever point in time um, left this, this halo. And yeah, this gully is ancient. And then you do a kind of a little bit more technical rock traverse and you get onto an arete, then you get onto a, a triangular ice face and then some rock climbing, and then above like a five, seven step of rock, not, you know, you, you got to pay attention for sure. And you got to clear out snow mushrooms and stuff. But then you get into this magic strip of ice that's five rope lengths long, and it's just perfect. I described it as Khamisi's drop of water frozen in time. It is so directissima. It is so vertical, so perfectly let a drop of water fall from the summit, and, and that's where I shall climb. This was a drop of ice off the Emperor Ridge, and just perfect. And the rock was really good. The ice is really good. A little bit of challenge to it, but great protection, both ice screws and rock equipment. So real, you know, quite a safe feature. And you get up, and then you join on to the Emperor Ridge that was climbed by Ron Perla and Palm Spencer in 61. So you join into the history. You still have a half of the mountain to ascend. Uh, maybe not a half in, in terms of its verticality, but its horizontality, its, hor its horizontal distance. You're just touching it when you hit the, you know, the top of, when you hit the Emperor Ridge. You know, you still got over a kilometer to go to get to the summit. And climbing underneath those frozen match strikes, the gargoyles, you know, it's, it's otherworldly. There's no other way to describe it. And you get to the end and you go up this gully that uh, Don Clouch climbed when he finished the, him and his team finished the wishbone red in 58, I think. But there, you're in that history again. And you get to the top and, you know, we were up there at midnight. So, you know, we had our howling and our hugging and our bit of crying. And we went down a bivy close to the summit. Next day, we went up and took some pictures. And a number of times I've measured the mountain I could see farthest to the north to the one I could see farthest to the south. And the one that I can see farthest to the south is uh, Mount Athabasca. And I forget the one to the north, but it's 200 miles of visibility. And uh, yeah, such a great uh, time with all of those guys all of those, all my climbing partners, you know, the real value, the attempts with Jim and with Ward and with Steve and with Jojo and with Rolando and, and Eric and Philippe. Yeah, those are the things that, are, as Philippe said, you know, in one of his uh, writings of the route is Robson reached into his heart and the roots of Robson and are contained in his heart now. So you're probably thinking, wow, what a great place to end this story. But there's another character who's popped up throughout this episode. And well, he had some unfinished business up there on the Emperor face. After Barry climbed Infinite Patience, I was like, all right, I got to do this. 
By the early 2000s, Steve had become one of the world's leading alpinists. Some might even say he was peaking. In 2005, alongside his partner Vince Anderson, Steve made the first alpine-style ascent of the Rupal face on Nanga Parbat in Pakistan. The climb took Steve and Vince to the far edges of what's possible in the mountains, and it even won them the esteemed PLA Dior. But Steve kept returning to the Canadian Rockies, and in 2007, he set his sights back to Mount Robson. The Emperor face is where that whole journey had started for me, and so I became a little bit obsessed with it. In the previous years, Steve had learned a lot more about Canadian Rockies' conditions. And so I, I was like, okay, I'm just going to watch the weather. I'm going to be get kind of geeky about this. I'm going to get kind of aggressive about it. I'm going to start charting the temperatures and the highs and the lows and the precipitation events for, for months until I find the right conditions. And I'm just going to get in the car and I'm going to go up there and I'm going to go with a partner and I'm going to go climb that thing. Finally, in late May 2007, the conditions were looking perfect for the Emperor face. Steve called various partners inquiring about their availability, but none of them could go. So, nearly out of options, he called up a young climber from Washington State. His name was Colin Haley. I don't know if, I don't even know if he was 20, 21. I was a full-time student at the University of Washington. Lived with his parents, uh, you know, didn't, I don't know if he had a car. Colin, who much like Steve years before, was an up-and-coming North American alpinist who had already made numerous impressive ascents in Canada, Alaska, and beyond. He was psyched for the opportunity. Like I had been, to, uh, you know, all those years earlier, to just go with the drop of a hat. And it didn't matter what else was going on, he would just go. And so when the weather happened, I said, okay, we gotta go. And I was like, yeah, I'll go. <laughs> Steve picked up Colin and they made a beeline for British Columbia. Once there, they chartered a helicopter to save time and make the most of conditions. They flew into the Helmet Robson Call, an area more or less between the Cane Face and the North Face. It was Steve's idea to helicopter in, but then once we were talking about taking a helicopter, it was my idea to helicopter to that spot because I had soloed Robson by the North Face three years earlier. And when I soloed the North Face, I down climbed the Cane Face. So I had already crossed over the helmet Robson Cole on that climb. And I already knew that the Cane Face was an easy way to get down and whatnot. So I was like, I've been down the Cane Face before, so this would be a, a good tactic. The duo made a bivy, trying to get some rest before their climb the following morning. The line that Steve had picked out, you know, he had been to the Emperor Face several times before, and he had an idea of the line he wanted to try. The plan was to traverse in from their bivy to an area near the base of the Stump Logan route. But Steve wanted to take a more direct line, and he wanted to climb it in one day. The next morning, they went for it. You know, we crossed the Shrund at first light, Colin led a couple of pitches uh, to kind of get us established under the strip of ice I was targeting. Colin led the first block, which covered a lot of terrain during the first half of the route. On my block, I think there were like, I don't know, a couple sections of M5 or something like that that of course were a bit tricky, but nothing too crazy. Kind of ice gullies that were fairly moderate and quick moving. The team made good time. But up higher, as the face became steeper, Steve took the lead, starting with a steep section of ice. And then that strip of ice took us straight up for a number of pitches, kind of onto a little face, a ramp, I would say, that then sort of twisted around and into this left-facing corner. And in that left-facing corner, I led a pretty long block there. By this time, the duo was really high up on the face. Up until this point, they'd climbed what they'd believed was a fully independent line. We had climbed, I don't know, like three kind of steeper pitches, and then on the fourth or fifth, something like that, which was the steepest pitch of the route and the crux pitch of our route, Steve was maybe like 10 or 15 meters above me, and all of a sudden I heard him yell, fuck! And I was like, ah! I like ducked because I thought he had like just ripped off a loose block and it was going to fall on me or something. But... 
he actually yelled it kind of in surprise because he found a fixed piton. And uh, it was just kind of surreal because we were climbing this face that we hadn't seen anything and we thought we were on a new line and it's kind of way in the middle of nowhere. At first, Steve was astonished, but then he realized this must be the fabled crux pitch of the Stump Logan route. And then all of a sudden there was a fixed piton and then a meter higher, another fixed piton, and then a meter higher, like two more fixed pitons. So it was like a, a big surprise. It also kind of clicked like, oh, okay, this is where they went. It was sort of this great, like, like their, you know, roots from that era, it's really hard to say precisely where they had climbed. And so to see that, it was like, okay, now we know, this is cool. That pitch, the very crux pitch, was the very last pitch on the emperor face proper. And we hacked out a little bivy ledge on the belay just above that pitch. And then in the morning, climbed like a few more rope lengths on these kind of like lower angle slopes above to where we hit the upper emperor ridge. Got to the ridge, burrowed through the cornice and popped up. And, you know, it was not easy street from there because you're thousands of feet below the summit. And then we did like a traverse on the south side below the gargoyles. And then finally, like a couple rope lengths on the wishbone arete to reach the summit itself. The two climbers celebrated. They had climbed a new route on the face, but up high on the mountain, they had merged with history, intersecting at the crux pitches of the 1978 Stump Logan. For Steve, it was a fitting end to his own personal journey on Mount Robson. It was warm, it was comfortable, it was not scary. I, w I was in my zone. I was, I was climbing really well, I was fit, and the climb felt really like it just kind of unfolded and went really well, so it was a great experience. I think it's fitting that the first episode for this new season of The Fern Line is about Mount Robson. These stories are about one route on one mountain, but to me, it's so much more than that. For generations, stories have been passed down in the climbing community, first through the oral tradition, sitting around campfires. There's been magazine articles written, tales told in books and films, and more recently through the world of audio and podcasting. For me to be hanging out in my studio in Alaska, connecting with my own climbing heroes like Jamie Logan and helping to tell their stories, well, it's a real honor. My hope is that these stories will add something to the climbing community, that they'll inspire future generations of climbers and that they'll stand the test of time. Jamie, when you think back to your time, your experience on the Emperor face of Mount Robson, what does that mean to you today? Well, I'm, I'm just quite proud of that we climbed that face that long ago and that it didn't get repeated for many years. And it's, I think it's only been climbed eight times. Steve, how did it feel for you uh, back in 2007 when you found yourself leading that crux pitch on the Stump Logan? What was it like? It was a little left-facing corner, not very, not very wide. The little buttress to the right only kind of stuck out maybe two feet. It was steep and clean. That was one of the reasons I went that way on that pitch, because it felt like the sort of safest, you know, cleanest line. So, you know, that's it, like you know you're on the right route when you climb where the pioneers climbed, right? Like that's they they saw the same thing. So I'm sure we just both saw like the same, like, okay, that's, that's where you gotta go right there. I try not to really focus on grades or how hard things are on this podcast, but I think it's worth acknowledging just how significant Jamie's lead was in 1978. Barry talked to Steve House about it after he repeated the line. You know, when you talk to him, he'll tell you that for 70 meters, he was on his arms. You know, his feet were no longer the supports, this was his arms. 
I think we thought it was like M8, 7 or M8. So that, to me, speaks of that difficult pitch that Muggs and Jamie had at the top. I mean, if, if that pitch is M7 or M8, you know, that might have been the hardest ice climbing pitch or mixed pitch in the world at that moment. So much of alpinism, I think, is this interplay between discovering what you yourself are capable of and wondering if what other people are capable of and wondering if you are capable of as much as the pioneers were. Hey, thanks for hanging out with me today on The Fern Line. This episode was written and produced by me, Evan Phillips. Music is also by me, with additional tunes curated from Artlist. Full track list will be in the description. Big thanks to Jamie, Steve, Barry, and Colin for sharing your stories. If you enjoy The Fern Line, please consider becoming a subscriber over on Patreon. You can find links in the description or at thefernline.com. Make sure and subscribe to The Fern Line on YouTube, where you can find full episodes as well as bonus content. And finally, a big thank you to our season six sponsors, Alaska Rock Gym and The Hoarding Marmot. All right, well, take care of yourselves. Peace out. We'll catch you next time on The Fern Line.